Ever since its debut in Final Fantasy III, the summoning mechanic has become iconic. As such, the summons themselves have become one of the most anticipated elements within each respective entry into the Final Fantasy franchise. But even though there are certain venerable figures such as Bahamut and Shiva that have become mainstays, throughout the years the developers have also introduced summons that were, shall we say, less distinguished. Whether that be through limited story involvement or trivial combat application, these summons would often be sidelined, doomed to obscurity. But it was those niche roles that would ultimately set them apart. Many would possess bizarre and remarkable qualities, and in some cases, very intriguing backstories behind their inclusion. And after covering some of the most iconic summons, it only felt right to shine a light on some of the most obscure. So, for today's video, join us as we pay special attention to a selection of summons that we feel are rather noteworthy, despite having a diminished presence in the grand scheme of things. Now, when you think of the name Eggman, it's hard not to think about the iconic villain from Sonic the Hedgehog, who also goes by Dr. Robotnik. But Eggman is also the name of a secret summon that, to this day, remains unique to Final Fantasy V. A literal egg with legs, Eggman was not made with Final Fantasy V in mind, instead being inserted as an allusion to the Hanjaku Hero series. Exclusive to Japan, Hanjaku Hero, literally translated to Soft Boiled Hero, is a collection of games produced by Square that became famous for serving parodies of other JRPGs in popular culture and depicting many farcical elements, such as numerous egg monsters including Odin, who was a play on Final Fantasy's Odin, as well as a popular piece of Japanese cuisine. What made this illusion quite apt though, was that the original Hanjaku Hero featured its own summoning mechanic, long before it ever featured in Final Fantasy III. This would allow players to use eggs to summon egg monsters to aid them in combat, however, this could not be done indefinitely and the monsters themselves would appear in the sequence of strongest to weakest, with Eggman being the weakest, as any moves he made would invariably fail due to his poor constitution as an egg. In Final Fantasy V, the magic lamp would function in a nearly identical fashion, allowing players to call upon summons in the order of the most powerful summon, Bahamut, to the supposed weakest, which was Chocobo. However, if players were to forgo recharging the lamp at the Istory Falls or the Great Sea Trench and summoned Chocobo 19 times, the magic lamp would then summon Eggman, who would perform his signature ability, Egg Chop. Just like his original incarnation in Hanjaku Hero, unfortunately Egg Chop would ultimately fail due to being too far away from the target, and interestingly, Eggman's sprite would not even be visible, making Egg Chop's inability to reach its foes all the more valid. That the developers at Square went to such lengths to include this lavish easter egg is incredibly commendable, especially as it was as much of an internal joke as an external one for fans, and it's kind of understandable based on that why Eggman would never be seen again within the Final Fantasy franchise. The next summon on our list also debuted in Final Fantasy V, but even though it would appear in a few other games throughout the franchise, Unicorn would often lack presence, overlooked in favour of other summons focused on enhancement. Unicorn's base appearance in the series has seldom changed, with it being seen as a horse with a single horn and numerous palette changes. Its most dramatic design came in the Tactics series, where it was a multicoloured beast. Each time, however, it was almost always associated with the holy element, and would thus perform and teach white magic spells to the party. In light of its smaller presence within the wider franchise, Unicorn's first appearance is perhaps the most interesting, as it was not actually introduced as a formal summon. Instead, it was an animal, a core mechanic of the ranger job class that functioned similarly to the traditional summoning mechanic, albeit with more random qualities that factored in character level. Unicorn was the highest level animal that could be called upon in battle, as the player character would have to be level 60 or higher for it to have a chance to appear. Successfully calling upon Unicorn in this manner would then see the party's HP and MP fully restored in combat. It wasn't until Final Fantasy VI that Unicorn was introduced as a proper summon, performing similar curative and support abilities. 
This would carry on for its future appearances as a summon in the Tactics series, Final Fantasy Dimensions 1 and 2, and Final Fantasy Record Keeper, as well as its enemy appearance in World of Final Fantasy. The Unicorn Horn would also appear as a recurring item, fulfilling a similar healing role in earlier games before being replaced by the Remedy. In later games, this item would also appear sporadically, such as in Final Fantasy XI, where it acted as a weapon synthesis item, and Final Fantasy XIII 2, where it relieved both foes and allies of status ailments and buffs. As a healing and support summon, however, Unicorn in general would ultimately pale in comparison to more popular entries like Carbuncle and Phoenix. And perhaps characters like Ixion and Odin's accompanying steed Slepnir could be seen as far more distinguished replacements of Unicorn, at least from a visual perspective. Third up is Wit, a summon who stands to be one of the most interesting to have ever graced the Final Fantasy franchise. And that's because even though it only appeared in the Nintendo DS remake on Final Fantasy IV, its customizable nature made it unlike any summon ever seen before or after. Wit's base appearance was that of a small, white, sprite-like figure. Within the game's lore it was a Witkin, an Eidolon in a larval state belonging to Rydia that was essentially a building block for all other Eidolons. This fresh state would give it high potential for growth, translating into gameplay as an Eidolon that the player could customise in almost every way. As such, players were not only able to name Wit, but were also able to utilise the Nintendo DS's stylus to design a face for it and even obtain costumes for it to wear. Some of these included a goblin costume, which could be acquired upon completing the main story twice, and even a Zerimus costume, which was earned by completing the game's bestiary. In terms of Wit's performance in combat, when summoned, it would replace Rydia in battle for three actions, inheriting her equipment and HP and essentially acting on its own. If Wit were to fall in battle, this would also render Rydia KO'd as well. Its moveset could also be customizable by players as they could choose from a wide range of abilities learned by other party members to utilize in battle. Additionally, its individual stats could be raised by completing various minigames attached to each one of the stats. For example, achieving the highest score in the minigame Cecil's Gauntlet would increase Wit's strength stat, as well as reward the player with a paladin costume for it to wear. So far, Wit has only been available in the Nintendo DS remake of Final Fantasy IV, with it actively removed from the ports. Its only other appearances have been a cameo in Brave Exvius and within the Square Enix members' virtual world community. Even though Ark's appearances in the Final Fantasy franchise have been rather limited, they have also been quite impactful. This would especially be the case in Final Fantasy IX, where it was even integrated within the game's lore, something that was very intriguing as its origins were twofold and very obscure. Ark had the sole distinction of being the only known Terran Eidolon amongst the cast of Gaian Eidolons, and it was positioned as an equal to Alexander. Due to the nature of Eidolons being related to the societies that summon them, Ark would transform from an airship-like structure into a combat-ready mech, boasting the signature ability Eternal Darkness. Players could teach Garnet how to summon Ark through obtaining a pumice, but much of Ark as a summoned being would be shrouded in mystery. For one, it's currently unknown whether or not the Ark fought in Ulvert when trying to obtain the Gullag Stone is the same as the Ark Dagger learned to summon, the key distinction between them being the enemy Ark's inability to transform as opposed to the summonable one. Furthermore, just how did Ark come into being? While the Gaian Eidolons were made of the people's imaginations to protect its crystal, Terra's crystal was supposedly too weak to actually produce any of their own. There was also some speculation of Ark being a manifestation of the Terran memories of the ultimate battle warship, however, this could also be attributed to the Invincible. As such, the true nature of Ark remains unknown, and perhaps that was intentional, as the second origin story is that it had a connection to one of the earliest games created by Hironobu Sakaguchi, who would also serve as producer on Final Fantasy IX. Cruise Chaser Blasty was released in 1986 as a collaborative effort between Square and famed animation house Nippon Sunrise. Ark would have a design inspired by the robot that featured prominently within Cruise Chaser Blasty, and that same reference point would reappear within games like Record Keeper and even Final Fantasy XIV. Kujata would make its debut in Final Fantasy VII, which should have set it up for a high degree of stardom, but over two decades on, it has seldom reappeared due to some harsh game design choices. 
Kujata's design resembled that of a bovine beast with enormous and curved horns, and specific attention was taken around making it a valuable asset by granting it access to Tetra Disaster, a powerful attack that could inflict fire, ice, and lightning damage to all foes. The downside was that if there were any foes that absorbed any one of those elements, it would heal them instead of harming them, making it a rather risky choice to use in battle, especially when it cost 110 MP to use. Kujata was also quite difficult to find, relatively speaking. This wasn't necessarily that uncommon in Final Fantasy VII, as Knights of the Round had a pretty high barrier for acquisition, but as Kujata wasn't a top tier summon, and was kind of off the beaten path, with the players needing to hunt down a red dot that moved around the screen, it led to diminished interest. What also made Kujata a bit frustrating was that it suffered from a unique glitch, whereby if the player's materia inventory was full when they tried to pick it up, the player would not be able to swap it for anything else and it would essentially be lost. Perhaps because of these issues, Kujata was cut from the summon lineup after Final Fantasy VII, but it did reappear in Final Fantasy XIII as a Sanctum Falci, albeit as an NPC, and in Final Fantasy XIV and XV, where it would appear as an enemy with 14 in particular carrying some weight as it would serve as a focal point for Marauder class quests. By the time Final Fantasy XII Revenant Wings was in development, the franchise had featured a plethora of different summons, with Final Fantasy XII itself introducing a whole host of new ones that drew from Final Fantasy tactics. Many would return in Revenant Wings, but so too would many of the series' more recognisable summons. They returned in the form of the Yari Espers, who were unique to the Pavama or Floating Island Lemures. These Espers were distinct from the summons from other games in the Ivalice Alliance, with each even having some of their own lore. Popular figures like Leviathan and Shiva would see a comeback, albeit with interesting elements added to their persona, like Shiva having a Yari child and lover named Shivan and Shiva respectively. But the three flying thunder summons in Revenant Wings served to be some of the most interesting entries in the game, and indeed, would end up being some of the most obscure in the franchise. At the head of this grouping was Ramu, a recurring figure throughout the series, but sitting underneath were Raiden, a pupil of Ramu, and Rami, a mechanical automaton that had been created by Ramu. This would represent one of the first instances of a summon's own creation being a summon themselves. Furthermore, Rami would bear very slight resemblance to a monster Ariman in light of its single eye. Perhaps one of the most interesting things about Rami as a summon was the further context it granted to Ramu as a sage-like figure in Revenant Wings. Many of the espers of the Lemures were seen to have their own lore and history rather than simply functioning as allies in battle, and it wasn't often that we got to see a summon build a tool that essentially became its own summon. And coming in last, but certainly not least, is none other than Final Fantasy VIII's Doom Train. Doom Train is perhaps one of the most interesting guardian forces in the game, as well, it was literally a train. But not only that, it also alluded to past Final Fantasy games and possessed some of the most bizarre inspirations for its design. A summon of the poison element, Doom Train was, as its name indicated, a train with infernal features and a fiend-like face that could perform the summon skill Runaway Train. Sifting through the various occult fan magazines would give an indication on how to obtain Doom Train, and players would learn that they would need to have the Solomon Ring, six or more steel pipes, six or more remedies, and six or more Marlboro tentacles. Aside from inflicting status ailments and providing a unique battle experience for players when summoned, Doom Train would stand out quite distinctively from the other available Guardian forces in that it was the first instance of a ghost train being summonable, ever. And for this reason, it could also be viewed as a reference of sorts to Final Fantasy VI's Phantom Train. But interestingly, even though it was a train, its Japanese name was not Doom Train, it was Glacia Labalas, which actually is the name of one of Goetia's demons and the President of Hell. In demonology, Glacia Labadas was conventionally depicted as a dog-griffin hybrid, not a train, but it would also appear in various other Final Fantasy games, namely in Final Fantasy 3 and 4, as a humanoid monster enemy. Somehow, in Final Fantasy 8, however, Glacia Labadas would eventually become a train, and if one were to visit the Japanese version of the game's debug room, they would also find that Doom Train, or Glacia Labadas, had a placeholder name, which was Devil Thomas, a clear allusion to the famous locomotive, Thomas the Tank Engine. 
though it's not quite clear how or why the dog Griffin Glacier Labadas ended up becoming known as Doom Train within the English release, its very bizarre nature makes it stand out amongst the entire roster of Final Fantasy summons as being one of the most obscure ever created. And with that, I think we're done. They were seven of the most obscure summons you can obtain across the entire Final Fantasy franchise. Be sure to let us know in the comments below which you found to be the most obscure. And of course, if you enjoyed the video, please be sure to hit that like button and subscribe to the channel. I would also like to say a big thank you for putting up with my voice throughout this video. I've been quite ill recently and it's been a struggle. So thank you very much. All right, everyone. With that, this is Daryl signing out. I'd like to extend a big thank you to all of our Patreon and YouTube members and supporters, especially Benjamin Snow, The Livestream, Gregory, Lord of Morning, and Zedorn, who are super special Onionite supporters. And of course, a big thank you to everyone for watching this video. I'll see you all again soon for more Final Fantasy goodness.